Okay. Um, present. A very good morning to all the participants who are here today. Uh, I would like to just share a quick housekeeping rule before we start the session. Much obliged if all the participants can ensure that all the cameras or microphones are switched off. And for this session, uh, Prof Nemi has shared that she encourages participants to raise a question. So feel free to drop a question and our moderator will read the question and Prof Nemi will try to answer the question during the, uh, the talk session itself. At the end of uh, the talk, there will be a group uh, picture. Much obliged if all participants uh, can switch on their camera at the end of the session. We can take a group picture around uh, 12 p.m., uh, especially for our muscle of loss in healthcare and medical law student, much appreciated where all of the muscle of law student can take a group picture with our guest speaker. So for this session, it will be moderated by my two colleagues and the two colleagues are Miss Marini Arumugam. She's a lawyer which has been admitted to the bar, but now she's fully focused in teaching Bachelor of Laws as well as Master of Law student. The area of teaching includes law of thought, medical negligence, uh, as well as land law. And her area of research also includes medical law and uh, human rights. Uh, we also have Ms. Susanna Abdul Hadi, uh, who also have been admitted to the bar back in 20, uh, 2005, but she's now fully focused in teaching. The area of uh, specialization would be Malaysian legal system, family law, as well as intellectual property law. So I would like to pass the stage uh, to Ms. Marini to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, Marini, you're on mute. Thank you, Putri. Uh, Professor Dr. Putri Nemi Jankasen, fellow colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be with you today morning to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Dr. Putri Nemi Jankasen, a leading expert in medical and healthcare law in Malaysia, who will be speaking to us on the development on the law of medical negligence in Malaysia. Professor Dr. Putri Nemi Jankasen is a professor at the Civil Law Department, Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Law, International Islamic University in Malaysia. She obtained her Bachelor's of Law from the University of Southampton, England, and her Master's and PhD in Law from the International Islamic University in Malaysia. She then went on to complete an academic fellowship at the National University of Singapore in 2006. She currently teaches the law of tort and medical law at undergraduate level and medical negligence law at the postgraduate level. Professor Dr. Putri Nemi is a prophetic researcher and based on her extensive research has written in numerous local and international journals in areas relating to medical, healthcare law and ethics. She has received two outstanding research awards in 2007 and 2009 with her extensive expertise and experience is regularly sought after by the Malaysian Ministry of Health. She is the foremost author on medical and healthcare law in Malaysia, having authored several books, including nursing law and ethics, ethics relating to medical profession, cases and commentaries on medical negligence in Malaysia, which has been recently revised and republished this year and is available to the public. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Putri Nemi Jan Kasim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marini, uh, for the uh, for my the, the explanation for my Bayrata. It was very nice. And um, thank you, Taylors, again for inviting me. Thank you, Putri, and the uh, uh, the rest of the, uh, the the committee. I am always so ha happy uh, to be able to uh, speak to the uh, students that is in the Masters of Medical Law group, but I am told now that uh, what well, this is also open to many other participants and I am uh, really happy to see quite a number of support for my lecture. And my lecture is on the development of medical negligence law uh, in Malaysia. The cases, particularly because uh, I have recently updated uh, the book in by Sweet and Maxwell, and I really feel you know very I mean, fresh about it, and very passionate about uh, this particular topic. Okay, so um, I have told Putri that I have I have no objection if you 
uh, would like to uh, stop and ask me questions at any point of time. Uh, but I am going to stop halfway to actually take the uh, question and answers and the, the uh, Q&A and then I'm going to continue Okay, uh, after that. And uh, the other thing is, uh, when I prepared my slides, um, I, I mean, I got quite a number of slides. You know, medical negligence is a very big uh, topic. Uh, I teach uh, my master's uh, uh, for, uh, three, uh, for one, one whole semester that is about three months. Yeah? So I'm going to uh, compress it and I take into account that uh, at first when I'm invited for this master's of medical law, that means the students have already some background about the principles of tort law, uh, about the law on negligence itself. yeah. But uh, therefore, I'm going to be a bit quick on that. But just in case anyone who is uh, not familiar, uh, you can, of course, uh, stop me and ask me to explain. yeah. Because uh, I, I, I thought that I am uh, speaking to an audience with having... Um, is uh, quite, uh, I mean, the, the law uh, background, knowing about the core subjects and all that, okay? Okay, so uh, I will be sharing uh, my screen. Um. Is it is it okay? Yes, Prof. Okay, okay. So the 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 uh, the topic uh, given to me very nice. Yeah, uh, title given by Putri: Development on the Law of Medical Negligence in Malaysia. I mean, it's so timely when I you know my, my book came out, and this is as I said to you, I'm very my mind is very fresh on it, and I'm uh, was you know it was like about one i mean although i've been doing the cases but you know to, to really finish the book it took about one and a half years okay so um i would like to start with changing trends yeah in healthcare practice i think everybody knows this okay you i mean definitely we have the concept of patient autonomy okay being the dominant ethel okay in medical practice Okay. Of course, this is due to the fact that patients are much more literate nowadays. They can read uh, a lot of things yeah, in the internet. And you know, sometimes they really be believe we always call the professor Google. Okay. So they will, you know, all this they can read uh, a lot of things, you know, whenever the doctors uh, give them any drugs or want to do something on them, they can read about the risk and all that. And, they become very questioning. Okay. And also, of course, when uh, you know the growth of uh, private healthcare services and uh, because of commercialization, and particularly when they pay for their services, they tend to be a bit, uh, you know, they, they, they want everything to be perfect. Okay. And uh, they expect healthcare services to be as excellent as possible okay and when things go wrong of course they want accountability very much and because of these higher expectations okay they are no longer tolerant to substandard services okay so this is what has been happening okay healthcare services are expected to be excellent they want their money's worth and when they pay they cannot, you know, um, expect uh, all these, you know, su uh, substandard things going on to them. And the problem with uh, healthcare services is that it touches on two most precious commodities, that is life and health. Okay, so when it affects that, sometimes uh, the society they cannot uh, tolerate it when you know when. They lose their life because of you know the medical treatment, or because of you know uh, something happened and injure, yeah. I mean, uh, their their body and they cannot help uh, the the normal uh, what uh, health that they, they have. So they are very upset. Okay, and when things happen like that, the outcome, the implication of the treatment, they want justice. 
Okay, and that's why when it affects life and health, they demand justice through the court of law. And the problem with court litigation is, unfortunately, court litigation is the name, blame, shame culture. Okay, because you name the defendant, okay, and you know, you can, I mean, the, the cases I can read, everybody can read, particularly when it's on online uh, uh, what uh, apps, okay? And then you put the blame, even though uh, the person is not yet guilty, yeah? A person is innocent until proven guilty, yeah? But when you bring a case against a person, like you put some blame on them already. And then again, of course, there's the blame and the shame because even though that person at the end of the road and uh, cases sometimes take a long time for it to end, okay, but there is already the blame and shame there. Okay, so of course, I understand the, the, the position of the medical profession. Yeah, sometimes, uh, I mean, they are very upset uh, with court litigation. Okay, and, and I know that, you know, when I was doing my, my, my PhD time, yeah, when I interview doctors, you know, doctors and lawyers, they don't seem to uh, be, I mean, you know, uh, the doctors uh, don't seem to like lawyers very much, lah, I mean, from, from my experience. Okay, but of course, um, this is just some specific uh, situations that I face. Okay. Okay, now my lecture, because I'm going to uh, concentrate on the development. Okay, so I want to uh, look in uh, the, the development of the lecture will be focusing on this uh, uh, federal court judgment. Okay, of course, number one, I mean, everybody knows about it already. Lah. I mean, I think Fu Fiona uh, is a very landmark case in Malaysia, federal court, which actually uh made a lot of changes okay particularly it basically opened up the uh we can say uh way uh, the, the 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 healthcare we can say the, the the judicial landscape okay change okay and and adopt quite a lot of these like patient centered patient centered approaches okay and Fu Fiona basically embrace the Australian uh, case, uh, Rogers against Whitaker. Yeah, so Rogers is also another landmark case in Australia. Okay, uh, but uh, and it is known to basically adopt the reasonable, prudent patient test that actually was developed, introduced in the United States in the case of Canterbury against Spence. Okay, uh, so this is uh, already, uh, I mean there in the in the case yeah, uh, and then, but the problem with Fufiona okay the Fufio, uh, the Fufiona went on to a bit uh, create a bit of confusion okay because uh Fufiona okay they are uh, uh, stated that for duty to warn okay duty to disclose material risk of the doctor okay, the standard of care is Rogers against Whitaker Okay, Rogers against Whitaker, that is the reason for the patient test. I'm going to talk about it later. Okay. But the confusion was what about duty to uh, diagnose and treat? Uh, so there was some confusion there. Has the Bolin principle been, uh, uh, we, we will not use, have been abandoned for duty to diagnose and duty to uh, treat as well? So there was some confusion, and after that, after Phil Fiona, you know, there were some uh, inconsistencies in many, in several, I uh, can say, uh, high court judgments. Okay, uh, but then came the case of Zulhasmina, which put a rest to it. Okay, uh, Zulhasmina has put a rest to it, and basically, in the case of Zulhasmina, it is clear the standard of care. Okay, for doctors. For duty to warn, duty to disclose risk is Rogers against Whitaker, a reasonable prudent patient test. But duty to diagnose and treat, we still use the Bolan principle. Okay. So again, all this I'm going to elaborate more when I do bridge after this. Okay. Now another thing that uh, is now the development 
I must say Dr. Hari Krishnan, okay, which basically is a judicial precedent, federal court, that allows the claim of aggravated damages, judicial precedent of $1 million. Okay. And um, because of this $1 million, okay, I am, uh, what there is uh, already high court judgments following, but I can see a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, when I read the cases, sometimes, there is a confusion in the judgment between, uh, sometimes they use interchangeably exemplary and aggravated damages, which is two different things. Okay, but uh, I mean, I, I want to, I mean, develop this into article, uh, uh, still in the pipeline. Uh, okay, so this, but then I'm just going to focus, uh, nanti, oh, banyak pula lah, nak, nak cerita pasal this confusion. Okay, but then also the objective of aggravated damages, when I read the Cases after Hari, okay, I find that some, there is also some confusion, lah. You know, some cases, okay. Okay, then after that is Dr. Kok, Dr. Kok, Chung Se, okay. Now, this is about non-delegable duty of care, okay, which I'm going to, yeah, uh, elaborate. This is now uh, a very uh, common trend, okay. Uh, I, I can see uh, that, you know, few uh, cases has also adopted Dr. Kok, okay. Okay, so based on that, okay, let us start. The first one, I just want to give you uh, the landscape view okay, of what's happening in Malaysia. Okay, so what's happening in Malaysia, we can see an increasing number of medical negligence cases. And that's why, you know, last time when I want to update something, I think I can do it in a few days, but Wow, from after, I mean, I must say from after uh, after 2007, 2010, and then after that, 2011, my goodness, I take a long time, particularly 2013 and above. So many cases, even the ones that I can read, open up for me to read at the, uh, what, like uh, Lexis, yeah, uh, CLJ, okay, and all those uh, uh, places that I myself can uh, read rather than going uh, into the, I mean, of course, you know, if you want to see uh, some of the, uh, want to do really field research, you can go uh, to the court and all that, okay? Now, and and this is also, uh, I mean, uh, mentioned, okay, in uh, the health ministry da uh, da data, of course, sometimes uh, they don't uh, want to be very open about this, but uh, that is happening, lah, yes, cases on medical negligence on the rise. Okay, on the rise. And cases, uh, medical negligence cases are, of course, very much publicized in the social media. And, you know, people like to read. And uh, when people read, sometimes there is already, you know, they, as I say, sometimes they cannot uh, quite intolerant to uh, certain things that happen at the hospital. Okay. And all this, uh, I mean, putting in the 45 million, lah, whether or not at the end of, I mean, of course, this is just uh, the claim, yeah. Uh, at the end of the road, we are not sure whether they got, they got this. We got to read the, at the end case, it takes a long time, yeah, to know about this, okay. But, but then, of course, the awards can go to millions now, okay, millions now, okay, because of uh, the, uh, uh, aggravated damages, which uh, also in uh, this case, okay, uh, Stanley Isaac, okay, because 500,000 is only on aggravated damages because the, the patient died, okay, so you know the calculation, uh, fatal accident claim, section 7 and 8, if death under the Civil Law Act 1956, of course, you get less because you, you already died, right? But then, of course, this aggravated damages uh, is uh, 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 inflate the amount to be paid. Okay, so, this current trend in Malaysia, they are putting in high amount of damages, the claim, and at the end, because of aggravated damages, the amount, we can say that has definitely increased. Of course, we know that uh, the assessment for damages Okay, is being governed by the rule of restitution in integral. 
okay, to put the uh, the victim okay, back to the pre-accident position. Okay, what he needs as far as money can do so. Okay, so we got to calculate what he has lost as far as money can, can do so. Okay, loss of earnings and, and all these things. Yeah, uh, special. Okay, and under general. Okay, but now uh, it can it also include aggravated damages. I do not wish to discuss about exemplary because I feel I truly feel exemplary is not appropriate in uh, medical negligence cases because uh, in, in my opinion exemplary is when uh, some when, you know because it, it has no uh, compensatory element for exemplary okay it is uh, just uh, the objective is merely to punish okay? and uh, to me medical negligence cases are intentional sorry unintentional acts they are unintentional acts Okay, so I don't think uh, a word of uh, exemplary should be appropriate. Yeah, but I, I want to concentrate on aggravated damages. Okay, because now that is uh, the uh, we can say the uh, uh, what what uh, patients are. I mean, the plaintiffs when they make claim, they are asking for this uh, uh, ag uh, aggravated damages. Okay. They are claiming for aggravated damages, so they put it a lot. But then, as I said, Dr. Hari, the judicial president, is one million. Okay, and Dr. Hari mentioned that why? Because aggravated damages was uh, available. Yeah, was frequently awarded in the case in cases in Malaysia for defamation and malicious prosecution, assault and battery. Okay. But now, Dr. Hari mentioned the aggravated damages can be awarded for medical negligence cases. Okay? Because it involves real injury to a person's body. So it's still compensatory in nature. Okay, why is it uh, compensatory? If we look in the case of Dr. Hari, okay, it is about the anxiety that the patient felt. Okay, uh, You know, uh, the, the patient in Dr. Hari was not very happy that the doctor asked him to do the second operation. Okay? Because he said that, you know, because he was having some other uh, problem. But he said that after the first operation, he could the vision was still okay, but the doctor said it's temporary. Okay? But after the second operation, he suffered all this uh, very severe hemorrhage. Okay? And the eye was uh, drenched in blood for about 25 days. Okay, and after that he became a blind. Okay, for that uh, particular eye. Okay, and uh, he could uh, and you know the the vision has been affected. Okay, and the issue here is uh, failure. What failure to advise and what patient about the risk of bucking and blindness because the the plaintiff was very anxious about the second operation. He felt that it was unnecessary, and you know he he. Was not uh, he you know he was not happy to go for it. So all these feelings, yeah, okay, and also uh, the the claim against the anesthetist for failing to monitor. So all this, uh, the, the, whatever the transpired, whatever the the feelings that has you know that that caused that uh, to the patient, the court award that one million for aggravated damages uh, so that actually we can say hike up the claim okay uh, for for him okay okay so now i want to uh, go to this because uh, these aggravated damages as mentioned in the federal court now aggravated damages okay like just now special and uh, general okay it is to cover things like loss of earning, nursing care, transport, uh, okay, uh, and then for general, you're looking at pain and suffering, future earning, and perhaps if uh, relevant, earning capacity, and all that, okay, uh, loss of amenities for, for general. Aggravated damages is to be pleaded and to be on top of this, yeah, to top up, top up, top up 
of this special. And aggravated damages is awarded because claimant not just suffer physical injuries and all that, cannot work and all that. Okay, but aggravated damages is awarded because the 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 plaintiff usually the patient claim that he has suffered mental distress. His feelings have been hurt. All this anxiety, the, his something very intangible eh, we cannot see. Intangible loss, intangible loss. Okay, and um, and he suffered this because the way in which the defendant committed the tort. Okay, and also sometimes the defendant acted maliciously and willfully. Okay, and in an insulting manner. Winfield stated this. Lord Devlin in Rooks against Barnett, aggravated damages were appropriate where the manner in which the wrong was committed was such to injure the plaintiff's proper feelings of pride and dignity. Okay? And to give rise to humiliation, distress, insult. Okay. And of course, sometimes conduct which are offensive, accompanied by spite, malice, in, uh, what, uh, arrogance could lead to the recoverability of such intangible loss. So, in Appleton against Garrett, aggravated damages were given to patients of a dentist for injury to feelings, mental distress, anger, okay, and because why the treatment was unnecessary and was performed on healthy teeth, and the dentist deliberately in bad faith concealed from them the true condition of their teeth okay, that he could carry out dental work for profit. And in AB against Southwest Water Services, the Court of Appeal held that the law permits recovery of aggravated damages where the relevant conduct caused injury to feelings, okay, insult, indignity, humiliation. Okay, and the manner of which the, uh, the thought was committed had aggravated the plaintiff's injury. So that's the objective of aggravated damages. So that has been applied after Dr. Hari to Malaysian cases. Okay. And of course, sometimes when you read the case, a bit unclear at some cases on what are the aggravating factors actually, whether it achieved what I mentioned just now, but those cases are there. Okay. And we can see that uh, Stanley Isaacs, let us look. Amount awarded five hundred thousand, okay, and the reasons are for award uh, for the award why the court was a bit lengthy here to explain why uh, aggravated damages was awarded because fa uh, the failure of the uh, defendants to follow up with the blood investigation, okay, and uh, I mean uh, uh, I mean you can read the facts okay about this because uh, you know she. She had a diagnosis from a private hospital, and then she, uh, what, uh, admit herself to HKL. Okay, so uh, th th that is uh, to, to follow up with blood investigations and to give an accurate speed, uh, speedy di diagnosis, and the fact that she was intolerant to tramadol, and you know she was very anxious about this and all that. And the other thing that uh, aggravated damages was award because words and conduct during the doctor's meeting. The, the, the uh, deceased family members was considered to be disturbing and appalling. Okay, so that is uh, what uh, has been uh, the reasons, yeah, for aggravated to be awarded. Okay, and uh, the case of Nur Sharafina, two hundred thousand. Okay, and this was awarded because. It has caused plaintiff unnecessary distress. She was clearly overwhelmed and upset by the whole experience. Okay, and the defendant had uh, ignored the advice given by the court and to, to the government hospital. Deliberately refused to disclose internal inquiry report. Okay, and deliberately refused to comply with the consent judgment. Okay, and uh, in this case, Pew Pew Ma. Okay, the award seventy five thousand. And the reasons were the defendant lied under oath, non-compliance of hospital own guidelines, violating the patient autonomy when he failed to inform the plaintiff 
the choices of treatment. So these are a bit an overlap, okay, uh, given, and uh, had taken the role of instructing solicitor, okay. And Ahmad Radik RB, Ahmad Rijal, okay, where uh, the amount, okay, let's see. Uh, 300,000 and uh, they put the blame yeah, because why? They say that they, they uh, what, uh, put the blame on the deceased okay? uh, when clearly there was, they had at the end admitted that there was negligence okay? and so that is uh, all this uh, all this we can say intangible loss, the feelings that have been affected to the plaintiff and to the uh, family members at the end Okay. okay, Arif Budiman, uh, 50,000 aggravated, and the court held that in determining a fair and reasonable amount of granted damages, the court may also consider the act and motive of the defendants, the plaintiff status, character, injuries, affecting feelings caused by the defendant. And Ahmad Takif Amzar, amount of aggravated awarded 100,000. For the defendant's suppression of the plaintiff's medical records, causing the plaintiff to incur avoidable law costs and expenses and time in filling the pre action discovery. Okay. And Muhammad Zulkar 9, amount of uh, awarded for aggravated damages, 150,000. Okay. And but then, uh, according to this uh, judge here, it says that 1 million to very high. Okay. Which uh, Dr. Hari has put a judicial precedent on. Okay, and um, and they say that an award of hundred fifty thousand is much more reasonable. And uh, in the case of twenty twenty one, Marie Sosela, okay, uh, this one is the case I'm going to deal with that in breach. Okay, and the amount two hundred thousand. Okay, and a lot of things that has happened, which I'm going to show you in uh, when we do breach. Okay, so. We can see that this is one of the present trend and uh, for medical negligence cases, which was not there previously before Dr. Hari, okay, for medical negligence. Huh? Okay, so now it is already very common okay, to award aggravated damages for medical negligence claim. So that actually, uh, we can say, uh, increase or elevate the amount uh, that can be claimed by the patient in a medical negligence claim. Okay, so let us look at the elements. Okay, I am not going into detail about, as I said, there are be a lot to explain. If so, just a quick uh, need for uh, for those who are not familiar. To prove the burden of proof to prove medical negligence is on the plaintiff, usually the play, patient. Okay, sometimes we call claimant patient, plaintiff. Okay, the, the burden is on them to bring uh, this uh, uh, what to, to 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 prove all these elements. Okay, for them to have a successful action in negligence. Okay, so first, the plaintiff uh, or the patient needs to show that. When the, uh, the the person that they are bringing claim against, usually the, uh, is the defendant, of course, and usually it's the doctor, okay, whether the doctor owe them a duty of care. Okay, and then that okay, straightforward, I mean, if I use a patient and doctor, lah, so whether the doctor has breached the standard of care, okay, whether the, the, the doctor has breached that particular duty owed. And the last one is, the plaintiff has, the patient suffered damage because of the doctor's breach of duty. So there must be a causal link yeah, between the breach and the damage. Okay, so this is the, basically the elements. Okay, and always we have to bear in mind not all errors are negligent because to err is human. Okay, uh, judges do take that into account. But when we say that you are negligent, Failure to meet with a certain standard practice in your specialization. Okay. And medical negligence is failure to meet the standard of practice okay, for the average qualified person in your profession. If you're the nurse, the doctor, okay, the, the pharmacist, okay, uh, practicing 
in the specialty in question. So, but then if you are a, 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 a specialist, you have to compare with the specialist. You don't compare specialist with a GP. Okay. So, occurs, uh, and then it occurs not merely where there is an error, but when the degree of error exceeds the accepted norm. So, that is medical negligence. And the first element, duty of care, this one, this element usually not a problem to overcome if you are, it's a relationship between doctor and patient. Because between doctor and patient, there is already existence of such a duty. Okay. And because why? Uh, there is a duty okay, on the doctor because the doctor will owe a duty to those he can contemplate that will suffer foreseeable loss. And patients are those who are closely and directly affected by his act. That's very logic. Okay. So uh, between doctor and patient, no problem. Okay, doctor and patient, there is already a duty of care because patient is doctor's neighbor. And we can see that whatever the doctor do, the patient will, of course, be affected by his act. Okay, it's definitely, you know, we, we, uh, the test of neighbor principle can definitely be uh, uh, overcome here because there is foreseeability of harm. Okay, I can foresee that whatever I do will cause harm to you and proximity, you are closely and directly affected by my act. Definitely. Okay, there's the nearness there. And duty of care, of course, arise between doctor and patient relationship. So, in the case of Lung Huai Ling, okay, again, Dr. Azhar, where the duty of care was mentioned that the plaintiff was referred to the first defendant who advised and treated the plaintiff. Okay, so although he was referred and the first defendant had treated him, therefore, there is a duty of care arises and they applied, the judge applied the case of of the crown participant, when you yourself portray that you have that skill and somebody come to you, okay, to, to get advice, to get treated because of your specialization and you decide to treat them, of course, there is a duty of care. So no problem, okay? The, a little of a problem is what if the claim by the plaintiff, the plaintiff is not the patient but the plaintiff are third parties, okay? Third parties who have some connection with the patient, okay? And in certain circumstances, the doctor may owe duty, not just to the patient, but to others as well. As long as it comes within the neighbor principle, foreseeability of harm and proximity. And of course, we have the third, uh, in duty of care, the third element given by Kaparo Industries against Dickman, that whether it is just and reasonable to impose such a duty. Okay, uh, the, the issue of policy consideration. Because under duty of care, the court fear floodgates. Indeterminate liability for an indeterminate amount to an indeterminate class. Okay, so there is an uh, issue about that. Uh, so the, because duty to third parties, there'll be many, yeah? Okay, third parties. So, but then we we'll here look at Various situations, duty of care to third parties. Uh, under medical negligence, what if the third party, particularly the family, suffering psychiatric injury? Okay, while witnessing what happened to the patient, uh, the, the parents, my only child, after this uh, negligent treatment and my, my child get brain damage, so mother su suffering psychiatric injury. And then what if the doctor prescribed drugs to a patient, did not tell, did not warn of the risk and the patient, uh, that the patient will go to sleep and then the patient drive a car and hit a pedestrian on the road, pedestrian third party. Giving drug to the mother, did not ask whether you're pregnant and then injuring the unborn child. But as we know, uh, unborn child is, doesn't have any legal identity until born alive. Okay, so any claim must be brought by the mother. Okay. And third party, uh, this is uh, a lot now with the issue of COVID and also, but then uh, a lot of cases concentrating on AIDS, okay? Uh, because why should the doctor inform uh, particularly that this particular person uh, has AIDS and AIDS uh, can be transmitted through sexual intercourse, uh, blood transfusion, and I think doctors will know maybe saliva. So, you, I mean, it doesn't affect the whole community, so to, to what extent, isn't it, that you've got to reveal. So these are uh, the issues, okay? But I'm going to concentrate on uh, psychiatric injury, okay? Psychiatric injury, family members suffer psychiatric injury. The first thing 
the law on uh, psychiatric injury under medical negligence uh, and also under negligence generally, you will first distinguish the person falls under primary victim or secondary victim. Okay, uh, so that's very important because primary victim very easy to claim. Primary victim because why there are not many of them, so you don't fear floodgates. Okay, primary victim like for example in the road uh, in the car accident, the primary victim is in the car also like you know like your 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 child is in uh, accident and then uh, you are the mother beside the child. Uh, you see you see something so no problem. But secondary victim are those who come after that. Who go to the hospital the aftermath, okay? And there are quite a number lah. Okay, there will be uh, many who come to the mortuary, maybe to 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 see uh, everything that happens. Okay, uh, so this secondary victim, there are many of them. So fear floodgates, and got fear floodgates. So more stringent requirement. Okay, but uh, primary victim, uh, the test to be satisfied is if you can foresee physical injury, you can also foresee psychiatric injury. Uh, so, therefore, you must have foresee personal injury. Of course, you must suffer, uh, the, the person must suffer genuine psychiatric illness. And then if you can suffer physical injury, you can also suffer psychiatric injury. The case is page against myth. Of course, are uh, very clear about Dr. that. Na. Yeah. Okay. And the case of Ya against Medway, uh, okay, we put this into, we translate what I said into a medical negligence case. Okay. And the court held that the mother who is delivering a baby, okay, uh, that, you know, whatever she suffer, okay, whatever she suffer, okay, she is also suffering. Uh, if she, we can foresee physical injury, we can also uh, see uh, uh, psychiatric injury, yeah? So the mother is usually the primary victim, okay? But secondary victim, much more stringent, okay? Because why? The court will look at if you are secondary victim, that means you come after that, you are come, who are you to the patient, okay? There must be really love and affection that can trigger psychiatric injury. There must be, uh, you must see something that will trigger. Uh, yeah, you can become uh, uh, cool, lah, not, not, not okay, lah, psychiatric problem. Because you see something like blood oozing, lah, screaming, lah, apa. you cannot see dead body in the mortuary. Too many people will see the dead body. Okay, And then you must see it with your own eyes, your own ears, hear with your own ears, your own senses. Not people tell you, not told by third party. Okay, Like in the case of Shorter Against Sari and Access, she was told about her sister's death through uh, the telephone and all that. Okay, All these series of her. But, but, but although she's close to the sister, okay, but because why she was not told uh, she did not see it, okay? And the, the series of events was over a period of time, but not she, she did not see this sudden appreciation of the horrifying event, okay? So there are quite more cases. Those who uh, have my uh, book by International Law Services too, they can read it, okay? And duty of care to stranger is another problem, okay? But although under the English common law, it's quite clear, okay? The Hargrave against Coleman, Okay, mention that doctors do not owe a duty to stranger because you did not put the stranger into that harm. So why should you owe a duty? So like the doctor do not have to play to, to be Spider-Man or Iron Man. Call for help, you go and help. Okay, so the doc, under the English common law, you don't have to be the good Samaritan. Okay, so if say you are walking on the road and somebody scream for help, you can just walk away under... Because you did not put that person in the, uh, in upper, uh, you did not cause the injury in the first place. Okay, so that is uh, the the position of the English common law. The dictates of charity and compassion do not constitute a duty. Okay, it may be a moral duty to help, but it is not possible to make it a legal duty. Okay, again the court fear floodgates, and this is about non feasance yeah, omission. Okay, the court impose duty of care on misfeasance, positive duty. So non-feasance omission is a little bit tricky. Yeah, we have a lot of discussion on that. Okay. Uh, so in Ang Yang uh, Yu Meng, okay, the doc, uh, we can see that the, the court held that, okay, there is no duty of care for the plaintiff to be the doc, 
to, to be good Samaritan unless there is special relationship between the parties. Okay? So at that time, uh, the, 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 the doctor was not in the clinic but the parents brought the child but the intern did not want to uh, treat but he just gave uh, Walteran and asked to go to the hospital but the child died. Okay, but uh, at the, uh, here they, they mentioned about this issue on duty of care and say that the doctor do not have to play good Samaritan. Okay, now this is a very famous landmark case in Australia. Okay, where, where changes has been made about uh, they departed from the English common law. As I said, English common law says you don't have to be good Samaritan. You don't you don't have a duty of care to treat stranger. But loans against wood changed that in Australia where duty of care has been imposed on Dr. Loans for failing to treat Petri, okay? Uh, you know, his clinic was 300 meters away. And then uh, the, the child was having like epileptic seizures, okay? And the mother asked the daughter to go and call this Dr. Loans at 300 meters away, but Dr. Loans do not know this family, okay? But the court held that 300 meters was near, you could come. And then uh, causal proximity because you had rectal valium in your clinic and you could have done something about it to stop the, 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 the scissors and minimize the harm. And circumstantial is you were at the place of practice when the call was made. And also because of the legislation and the expectation of society and in Australia, duty of care was imposed, Dr. Loans, to the play, uh, the uh, uh, the, the uh, Patrick, uh, pl uh, the plaintiff who was a total stranger to him. Okay, so that became uh, quite a landmark case. Okay, and this has, this is a discussion in Australia. Okay, whether or not doctors should uh, go and uh, be a good Samaritan, and you know because why? Uh, the the case of Doctor Decker. Now he was uh, she she was uh, what uh, you know uh, you know was at the junction, and suddenly there was a car that just. Uh, what uh, go uh, what, what drive uh, very fast beside her nearly hit so she was like in shock and hit and then the car like landed in the ditch or something to that and because she was so like uh, we can say in shock okay because of what has happened she did not go and see what happened to the people in the car she went to the police to make a report but then the tribunal brought an action saying that she should have gone to see because what, what she can do to help them at that time because as a doctor, the profession is the conduct of a doctor that saving a human life is the first thing that you need to do, basically the basis of Hippocratic Oath and all that. Okay? Uh, but then, of course, the, uh, what, uh, what she you know, uh, claimed that at that time, she was just uh, too like, uh, the feelings of shock and all that and she you know straight away went to the uh, police and did not go and see yeah what happened to the uh, victims in the car okay but the court of appeal overturned there was a uh, quite a discussion on this okay uh, and this the dr decker did not go a duty to assist the driver okay so they distinguished loans and all that and uh, the case here illustrate how difficult the difficulty okay uh, of imposing your yeah, duty on the medical pr pr practitioner for strang uh, to strangers, lack of guidance. Sometimes doctors need to know about this also. Yeah, so we are very much. Uh, I think there are quite a uh, few uh, doctors uh, from private hospital have writing about this. Uh, that you know, the, uh, you need to be very clear. Lah, I mean, to have this guideline and also asking for good Samaritan law. Why? Because good Samaritan law uh, protects because you know. When you go and help, the English common law say you don't have a duty of care to help strangers. But once you touch the person in that kind of scenario, the duty of care crystallizes. Okay, so that means, uh, but then of course you will be, when we want to determine breach, you will be compared to a person that uh, treat in, in that kind of limited circumstances. Okay, so, but then the problem here is that the medical prof uh, professionals, they would want to know when, when should they play a good, a good Samaritan and also they want to be protected. That's why in many Western countries where they have developed this good Samaritan law because they want to protect those who uh, what, uh, lend a help in this kind of condition, 
you cannot sue them for negligence unless there is willful, uh, you know, gross negligence. Okay. Uh, so this good Samaritan law very important lah, uh, because then doctors don't feel damn if we do, damn if we don't. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, this is uh, what? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, Prof, to interrupt. Okay. There, there is a oh. question here from Doctor Vino. Okay. So I will, I will. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let, okay. I will stop here. And I will take some questions and then I will continue with the second element, okay? Um, okay, sorry, Prof. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question from Dr. Vinod. Is there any current ruling to obtain patient's permission to inform patients next of kin mm -hmm. for a condition which might affect them? Example he gave is uh, informing a wife if the husband is HIV positive since she yes. can be affected by it as well. Uh -huh. What if the patient refuses? Will, be a, will it be considered doctor? a uh, breach of doctor patient confidentiality okay thank you very much uh, question now duty confidentiality is one of the core tenets okay uh, in medical ethics and it is also part of a uh, uh, legal duty because you get the information uh, because of your relationship with the patient however there are uh, certain exceptions that duty of confidentiality can be uh, breached. And one of them is when you want to protect a third party. So under the law, okay, under the, uh, the development of the law, you can develop third party. And if you look at the consent guidelines, uh, 2016 by the MMC, Malaysian Medical Council, you will find a provision I cannot remember by heart now. I've got to look back. Uh, the pro uh, provision that duty of confidentiality can be breached, okay, when you want because of public interest and for the protection of third party, okay. So there, there is no problem. Uh, there is a duty of confidentiality, but you can, uh, and third party includes those who are very much going to be affected, okay, like for example, uh, if the spouse will be affected by HIV, you need to inform the spouse. But you cannot inform those who are not affected. You only inform uh, those who will be affected. And then, the, and then you must always remember for duty of confidentiality, the protective privilege ends where public peril begins. Okay, So this means that the, the duty of confidentiality ends where public danger begins. And under that, the third party is also very important. And we have the case of the US case that has been applied in the UK of the case of Tarasov, okay, uh, where you know the, the 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 doctor itself is made to be liable for not informing uh, the family and Tatiana who was killed by a patient, okay, that uh, how how dangerous this patient is. So that there is no problem, particularly you know that there's danger to third party or harm to the public, okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Vinod. That answers your question. Um, do you have any other questions from anyone else? Right, Prof. Dr. Mazida is asking, uh -huh. uh, would you be able to elaborate on medical indemnity scheme? Does it cover negligence? Wow. <laughs> I think I'm not the person uh, to ask that. Uh. Uh, medical indemnity, I know we have uh, you. Uh, we have medical defense, uh, medical protection society. I think uh, you need to ask the nitty gritty uh, to those uh, organization. Yeah. Uh, of course, I know that they also uh, need to be uh, quite. Uh, uh, you know, as 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 any insurance companies. You know, they like to exclude things and also, you know, to, I mean, for their sake, isn't it? Uh, now also, uh, my medical coverage say cannot cover COVID, lah, cannot cover all this. Lah. Uh, for us juga lah kan? So they, uh, this is up to them. Lah. Uh, so I, I'm not in that position to speak uh, on this area. Okay, you need to ask uh, the medical indemnity organizations. But I know too, I don't know whether there's more. But I know about Medical Defense Union, Medical Protection Society. Yeah, I think the private doctors uh, know more. All right. <clears throat> Another question, Prof, from Dr. Nalini. Mm -hmm. In Malaysia, 
if a lady doctor on duty in a GP clinic and a lady nurse and a family member comes requesting for emergency help for, un, for an unresponsive person. Huh? In Malaysia, I think this one, uh, there's a doctor, lady doctor and a uh-huh. lady nurse in a uh-huh. clinic, in a GP clinic. And then someone else, maybe a, a patient, a prospective patient comes in. A family mm-hmm. member of the patient comes in asking help for an unresponsive person. So in Malaysia, with the danger of robbery and danger to modesty, both being ladies, we would decline but ethically wrong. How can we address this issue? Oh, uh, you mean that uh, you are in the clinic, both ladies, and what? Somebody uh, coming in, male? Um, I, can I say? Um, yeah, yes, please, please. Okay, Prof. Nemi is like this. Uh, uh-huh. This is like like loans and woods, but uh, uh-huh. it's a home in a home case where the patient is unconscious. Family uh-huh. runs to the clinic asking uh-huh. for help, uh-huh. and the doctor does not. Usually, we will decline because being ladies, okay. we do not know what is the real situation at home. Mm. Okay, so okay. ethically, we are wrong. Yes, right, but uh, how can we address okay. this for our safety? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, very good question. Okay, now, uh, okay, because in Malaysia, we have yet to, although loans against wood scenario, okay, has not, we don't have a judicial precedent in Malaysia that applied loans. Okay, but loans progresses, uh, the development of the judgment progresses uh, with, of course, uh, looking into also applying Rogers against Whitaker, uh, the patient kind of autonomy centered kind of approach. Okay, and uh, and and uh, be, uh, because of that, loans departed from this uh, English uh, common law and allowed that. Okay, and also because loans has that legislation. Okay, we don't have the legislation. We don't have the uh, any any judicial precedent. Okay, uh, uh, applying loans, but as I said, because our federal court applied that Rogers, maybe the next case that come, they want to apply loans we do not know but you know australia very uh, influential also to our judges okay but at the moment i can say that english common law still prevail you can decide not to treat because why one when the person come one thing there is no yet any contract yet okay first contractual obligation pun belum lagi ada okay none yet no offer acceptance consideration none okay and then when you come well, I mean, you don't, you based on English common law, you don't have to treat strangers. Okay, but Malaysian Medical Association last time put that, uh, I read in the newspaper and also they have the guidelines, I think, I uh, cannot remember, quite a long time ago, that you must give minimum treatment. As a doctor, as a clinic, katalah, that person is bleeding to death. You cannot like, leave the person to die, okay? So you must maybe put some bandage and send him uh, to the government hospital lah. Uh, okay, they, uh, so uh, you must at least do minimum thing. Yeah, you cannot just leave him to die. Katala, even you come to the private hospital, you uh, mean you know you cannot pay that the deposit. Then you leave that person to die. You must give the minimum treatment that is ethically right minimum, and then send him elsewhere. Okay, but but and as I said. When the person comes, you can refuse. There is no contractual obligation. Ethics is part of, uh, and then, uh, the, the, and then is uh, not violating the English common law which we apply, okay. Uh, but then we have to take into account that, of course, ethically it's not right because ethics is part of morality, okay. Uh, it's a, uh, ethics is subset of morality. What is right and what is wrong in society, but that's why. Whether or not we are going to make it, we need clear guidelines. Yeah, we need to develop this. Whether that's why that, that's why there is this uh, dilemma. Okay, so you know if we can uh, have clear guidelines to show that what you should do in an emergency, whether you know you should treat or you know not treat, and you know what you should do, maybe minimum, and you know all this is very good lah. Okay, and we need good Samaritan law lah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, one more from Dr. Noor Adlinda. Can the patient himself sign or request the do not resuscitate form? 
Ah uh, yes. Okay. Ah uh, patient now. Now that is part of autonomy. And now the uh, the problem uh, this is also another problem in Malaysia because we need advanced directive to be put in a clear proper framework. Okay? Like in Australia when you go to the hospital sometimes they already have the the form, you know. Uh, for you to fill in like you know that, that, that for the patient like, because it's part of patient autonomy okay very uh that, that you know you need to put there that you don't want this you don't want that and that that becomes a legal document okay but uh in malaysia you you have the the uh right to develop to make a living will but you know following all the rules of the will and make it a legal document and what you don't want and what you want and we call it the, the living will becomes what we call as advanced directive. If you don't want, uh, do, uh, do not resuscitate. But the content of the, li the living will must not be something that violates the laws of Malaysia. Huh? You cannot have like, I want active voluntary euthanasia when active voluntary euthanasia is under the penal code equivalent to culpable homicide. Okay? Uh, so you cannot have like that. Lah. Okay? Uh, so... Uh, that is, uh, but but then we we need, uh, of course, this is also another area in Malaysia because we want to be clear. Because the, I I know the doctors are also in dilemma whether they should follow when they are being given uh, what they consider is a living will. They look at it, but they are not sure the legality of the document. So if we have a proper document where the patient can put in, uh, so that that can be acceptable, then it will basically resolve this dilemma. Okay. Uh, but but if we follow and 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 uh, when when you are given this kind of document to uh, for it to be valid, the 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 person that makes it must be competent at that time. So again, there's an issue of competency. Okay, whether it's going to be legal legally valid because why to to have a legally valid consent, you need the adult. It must be adult of sound mind, eighteen years and above. The person must. Uh, not be, you know, that there is no undue influence, uh, caution, duress. And the last one, sufficient information has been given. So all this also needs to be looked at. That person must have the legal mental competency to draw up such document. So that's why, as I said, there need to be a proper legal framework for advanced directive. Okay? But it is one cardinal principle in medical law. Okay, Why medical law develop is because this, the, the, the cardinal principle is all adult of sound mind, they make their own decisions with regards to their health destiny. So based on that, medical law developed. Okay? Okay, so I need to continue. Okay, uh, yes. my, uh, can I continue? Uh, yeah. Because I think I got... Uh, I haven't come to this uh, lagi panjang nanti. Non-delegable yeah, okay. ni tak habis cerita lagi. Huh? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, okay. So okay? for, there are two huh? more questions but I think I'll ask that later lah ya, yeah, Prof. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, so we are coming to the second um, uh, element. Okay, after after you show, after the plaintiff slash patient slash claimant, okay, show that there is a duty of care on the part of the defendant to the plaintiff, you must show that the defendant has breached that particular duty code. And that means you have fallen below the standard of care required. Okay, and the standard is the reasonable man standard. Okay, reasonable man here means that if you are, I mean, you know, we want this reasonable man not to be too timid or too brave. Uh, we don't want to be too anxious. We just want a reasonable person, okay? We don't want a person that to think every path is beset by lions, okay? We don't want uh, to, uh, a person that doesn't want to do anything because so fearful or too brave, uh, like no thing that can kill one million with his own bare hands in, in one pulau, okay? Uh, 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 to kill uh, people. So, I mean, no? So, we don't want that kind of... So, Based on that, okay, the, uh, what the, the rule for negligence is that you are going to be uh, judged with a reasonable person. Okay, now 
But we are going into a detail because what if you are a professional? What if you are a professional like you are a doctor? Okay. Now, for doctors under medical negligence law, okay, the standard of care is divided based on the duty. Okay, why is it like that? It's already like that. Lah. Okay, so uh, when the patient come and see the doctor, what do you wait? Hang on. The battery low. Okay. Uh, when the patient come and see the doctor, the, the patient narrates symptom and the doctor will diagnose. And before the doctor treat, the doctor is uh, supposed to have a duty to warn or disclose risk. So there are three main duties. Duty to diagnose, duty to treat, duty to warn. Now, based on the late, uh, federal court, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, duty to diagnose, the standard of care is bolum bolito standard. Duty to treat, bolum bolito standard. This has been made very clear. Fufiona caused some confusion, but after this, Zulhaspina, okay. okay. Duty to warn, reasonable prudent patient standard. So I'm going to base on that. Okay. So let us look at uh, duty to diagnose and treat, bolum bolito standard. Okay, what does that mean? Now, Bolam says, if you are a medical man, negligence means you fail to follow standard of a reasonably competent medical man. Okay, and you will not be guilty if you follow according to the accepted proper by responsible body medical man. Now, Bolam went further to say that it doesn't matter if there is one body that is, uh, doesn't agree with you as long as there is one body that agree with you. That causes a bit of confusion after that because it, it, I mean, what if there are two body of opinion? One agree with what the doctor did, one don't agree. Okay, so that's when Bolito came in. Okay, so Bolito says that okay, you must follow a responsible body of accepted medical practice endorsed by a responsible body of medical man. But if there are differences of opinion, the standard of care is a matter of law. It's not a matter of medical judgment. Okay? Bolito, uh, Bolum to be read by Bolito, meaning that the court will decide which opinion reaches up to logical analysis. So the standard of care, okay, because why Bolum has uh, been misinterpreted and uh, by, by, by uh, what they, they, they understand that if the if uh, the doctor brings a body opinion to to uh, to agree with him, he will not be liable. But if there are differences of opinion, uh, the standard of care is not a matter of medical judgment. You are not to be judged by your peers, but you are to be judged by the law. And the standard of care is a matter of law. Okay, and the court is at liberty to reject medical expert opinion if the court feels that it doesn't reach a up to logical analysis. The court will scrutinize all evidence to adjudicate the appropriate standard of care. Okay, so that is what we call as the Bolum Bolito standard. So Bolum Bolito standard now, last time Bolum only one and two. Now Bolum Bolito means one, two, three. Doctor must have acted in accordance with accepted medical practice. Accepted practice regarded as proper by responsible body of medical man. And third, the court will decide which article opinion reaches up to logical analysis okay so these three must be uh, achieved lah before bolum uh, bolito ni. okay now let us look at some uh, cases uh, uh, i mean old case lah ching kiao okay very famous for not inquiry on the medical history of patient clear cut breach of duty okay did not ask the medical history of patient ko nang seng uh, you know put on the plaster of paris did not check the blood circulation uh, leg gangrenous had to be amputated, clear cut breach of duty. Chelia, manikam, uh, between uh, the wrong diagnosis, yeah, uh, between appendicitis and pancreatitis, thought that it was appendicitis but turned out to be pancreatitis. The case of Dr. Tebi, failure to identify the shape of the cell, okay, that it was, uh, and mentioned that it was benign, but actually it was cancerous and the patient lost quite a long time to basically, you know, the uh, cancer, if you can detect early, of course, you get, uh, you can, uh, what, uh, help the patient to to heal faster, okay, but to a lot of agony that the patient had suffered. Lim Pui Ling, against Dr. Azhar, 
failure to conduct proper cataract surgery and causing damage, okay, was a breach of duty. Okay, and Arif Budiman failure to treat and diagnose the origins of patient's fever. And at the end of the road, it was discovered that patient was diagnosed from all this uh, methicillin resistant uh, uh, this lah. Okay, uh, so this uh, clear breach of duty. And the case of Gurisha is a very good case to read for duty to warn, duty to treat, duty to diagnose, all there. Okay, and um, on uh, duty to warn because uh, later on also we, I will be coming back to this. Uh, to to uh, failing to discuss about the pros and cons of the available delivery surgery and duty to treat failure to undertake the McRoberts maneuver correctly okay and have put out the baby shoulders uh, before uh, they able to complete that maneuver and all this eh, to apply super pubic pressure and all this so this had constitute this breach of duty okay and could you share a failure to recognize that the patient had congenital deformity and she cannot like bend her leg when she deliver so her leg was like straight like that so it's very difficult for her to push and the fact that and then, and then that later the baby got uh, brain damage okay and um, the failure to recognize the congenital deformity was a breach of duty okay and in Lim Zi Hong breach of duty because of the uh, twins okay they were high risk uh, she was a high risk case and a failure to follow these guidelines that safe obstetric system would require emergency segment cesarean to be done on high risk patient. Okay, and this was not because she was a high risk patient. Okay, and the case of Turkia, uh, she wanted uh, early delivery, but giving her cytotec tablets to create the contraction uh, without taking into account the previous pregnancy, the previous history of pregnancies, putting her in high risk to suffer uterine rupture. Okay, and because of the intensity of the contraction, and she had already lacerations at her womb, okay, uh, at her uterus, and that basically aggravated uh, uh, and caused her to have this uterine rupture and bleeding, and she had to have her hysterectomy. Okay, and Zula Spina, the doctors were not in breach because why? She claimed that she came in at 36 weeks and she was in labor. But uh, they say that they closely monitored there was no signs of labor because she claimed that I was in labor. Why did you only give me Phenagon and all these painkillers? Uh, but then she was uh, not in labor. And uh, we got 30, at 36 weeks and her history was 30, uh, previous uh, obstetric history, 38 weeks gestation. And the thing is she suffered from an abnormal presentation, placenta precreta, which was not detectable. Now, uh, the, the doctor will not be uh, uh, in breach of duty when you, uh, if you don't diagnose a very rare condition, it's okay for you to diagnose a much more common condition with the symptom and rather than straight away go and diagnose a very rare kind of condition. Yeah, we have the case of Chian Tam Kong about that. Okay, and, uh, and the baby was delivered within 30 minutes and also the court also take into account the, there was a guideline, international guidelines that this is a uh, acceptable standard, so uh, they were not liable. And of course, uh, in the case of uh, Mary, where the plaintiff fell from the bed after being transferred from ICU to ordinary ward, and after that, the plaintiff was diagnosed to suffer from severe cortical dysfunction and all this. Uh, but the defendant was not in breach of duty, yeah, because the uh, eh, defendant was in breach of duty because Although the, the directive was appropriate to transfer the plaintiff, okay, from the ICU to normal ward, but the timing, the timing that they sent was not uh, right, and then they provided the plaintiff with a bed without a hand railing, okay, and that was a breach of duty of care, causing the plaintiff to fall, and then after the fall, the senior medical personnel should have examined the plaintiff after the fall uh, to see whether she needed uh, medical attention, and this wasn't done, okay. Okay, now uh, in the pandemic also, we can see that there can be issues of breach of duty, failure to follow SOPs, okay, okay, and guidelines placed by the driver authorities because sometimes in pandemic, there are certain guidelines that need to be followed. So there, is, there can be the breach of duty there and follow a failure to follow as accepted practice in the field of specialization. Sometimes international guidelines can be brought in, okay? And uh, an error of diagnosis is usually quite uh, pertinent lah 
in pandemic yeah uh, failure to carry out an examination test and you know and which but then it's only negligent again where a reasonable competent doctor would not have arrived or would have arrived at in that area of diagnosis we have to look the basic duties of duty to diagnose we know that you must ask the history we saw in ching kiao ask relevant questions and like may not between tuberculosis and Hodgkin disease is okay for you to diagnose a much more common condition and if there is the doubtful diagnosis like in the case of Gordon Wilson GP must send the patient for uh, more uh, upper test for the specialist uh, to send specialists if you're doubtful okay now so that is duty to treat uh, like Zul Haspina we have the duty to diagnose duty to treat all standard of care Bolum bolito, that three elements. Now, duty to warn, Zul Hasmina has clearly endorsed Fufiona reasonable prudent patient test. Okay, so this is why reasonable prudent patient take into account patient's needs, concern, circumstances. Because when you want the patient, the duty involves the patient. What the patient wants, what the patient is anxious about, because patients are no longer passive recipients in medical care. The concerns and circumstances of individual patient need to be looked at. Okay, and in Zul Hasmina, uh, doctor needs to disclose to patient all material risks inherent to post-treatment. What is material is not determined by the reasonable prudent doctor test, but reasonable prudent patient test. Okay, and this reasonable prudent patient test means what a reason. So, so like in Rogers, if I have only one good eye, what a one good eye reasonable patient, do you think that the risk of simple testing or salmia would be significant? Uh, so you ask a, reason, a reasonable patient and what of this particular patient that you are treating would want to know it would take significance. So like in Rogers against Whitaker, the desire of patient for information, I'm very concerned because I only have one good eye. So any risk befalling my good eye, need, I know that I will become blind. So I, I'm very concerned with that. So these are the things that you need to look at characteristics of the uh, patient. So that's why reasonable prudent patient test looks at characteristics of the patient. It doesn't like just look at what other doctors say. A uh, reasonable prudent doctor test, what other doctors say for that issue. Okay. But reasonable prudent patient test, what other doctors say is also important. But it becomes one of the factors amongst many other factors surrounding the circumstances of the patient. What are the factors? Medical, what are the doctors say that whether this risk is small, big or what, uh, how many percent? We take into account, but it become one of the factors. Because why you got to take into account? Even if the risk is small, like sympathetic osalmia in Rogers, one over 14,000, very minute, small. But if it happened, she will become blind. So you got to balance the risk with the gravity. Okay, the small risk, but then it happened, she will become blind because she had only one good eye. And then the patient keep on asking about this, whether my good eye will be closed. My... So that means she's very anxious about that particular issue. So it will become a material risk that you need to inform. Physical and mental health, that patient has only one good eye. Anything befalling the good eye, she will become blind. Is this the need for treatment? Is, this... Is there any time for reflect? In an emergency, it's okay. And we know that uh, consent also, you know, don't need for uh, emergency. Yeah? Uh, I will show of course. And, but then when there's a lot of time to reflect, particularly like cosmetic surgery and all that, of course, you need to tell a lot. Okay, medical practice, medical opinion. And if it's very routine, sometimes you don't have to tell so much. Like you want to take blood, a sample, or cerita banyak sangat risau. Of course, you know, uh, pening juga kan. So complex uh, surgery, yes. Okay. Let us look at some example in Fufiona, risk of paralysis, spinal cord operation, material risk. Lah. Lecevana Vasagar, risk of esophageal perforation uh, was considered to be a material risk. Dr. Ismail Abdullah, risk of acute bronchitis and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, procedure to remove stone. And Hassan Datullah, risk of paralysis, no reason, risk of uterine rupture. Huh? When you do procedure together yeah, to insert uh, the UCD and to do the DNC because she was also pregnant and she wanted to, she, she wants to abort the, because she already have five children, but then, you know, at that time she cannot cope with another one uh, coming so soon. Okay. And Abdul Razak, risk of aspiration, uh, doing the Ralph's tube. 
okay, uh, without emptying the stomach content. There's a lot of issue here in Abdul Razak. Maybe I don't have time. And uh, Dr. Hari, we saw that risk of bucking and blindness was considered to be inherent in that surgery. Ahmad Takib, risk of large abscess uh, that can, well, which was not uh, uh, what. Uh, what uh, advice? So it wasn't advice uh, for the uh, plaintiff's parent to refer to hospital and did not discover this large abscess that can lead to obstruction in the plaintiff's airway. And Gurisha, as I said, failing to advise the patient the risk and benefit of the delivery option for a big baby, now whether they should go for cesarean, what are the risk and benefit and all that. Okay, and one thing after 2007 for Fiona and until now, we can see the development in re, uh, duty to warn posterior risk. The court has given much emphasis on individual autonomy. Okay, and very clear in Noriza against Dr. Atu Samuel, where the plaintiff uh, was uh, have after the fifth baby, I think two three months down the line, she discovered she was pregnant. She couldn't cope with another baby too soon. She wanted to do abortion and she wanted to insert a contraceptive uh, device IUD. And the doctor did not inform her to carry out all this procedure together can cause the uter her uterus to be perforated. And she required emergency hysterectomy. And she was very upset because she come from a very large family. And she, although she already had five, she wants more children. Okay. So the court held that the choice was just. If you, as a doctor, you think that cukup lah, lima nak. But then uh, choice was theirs and they needed information and you got to give. There was an increased risk of perforation due to the plaintiff's pregnancy at termination and they want to know safer method rather than going to DNC, the ID procedure and failing, they were de failing to advise them there, they were not considering other alternatives available. Okay, and the MMC guidelines need to be read. You need to read because why? MMC has developed many provisions to help with the doctors to to gear up with the development, to adhere to the development of the law. And the MSC guidelines also has saying that there are cases where you don't need consent, okay? Uh, particularly uh, when the statute, of course, we have the prevention and control of infectious disease. Yeah, we know that in many uh, issues about COVID, you don't need consent because you can, under this uh, prevention disease, you can uh, uh, apply this yeah, and ask, and again, it's mandatory. Okay, to give sample and all this, all this. Eh? And then the defense of necessity under English common law can be applied. You don't need consent when the treatment is necessary to preserve life and mental health well-being of the patient. And also therapeutic privilege is a part of reasonable prudent patient test where you don't have to inform the patient if particularly the patient is in need, uh, what uh, can cause a psychological trauma and cannot balance lah, what actually the patient uh, you know, once, okay? So that is uh, the cases where consent is necessary. Now, there are quite a number of cases. Uh, of course, you know about res ipsa locutor. Uh, res ipsa locutor is a doctrine that is, uh, can be used by the patient, uh, by the plaintiff. Uh, when they invoke res ipsa, they don't have to prove each of the elements, uh, duty of care, breach, and uh, causation, uh, because uh, it's, uh, the thing speaks for itself. Okay, the circumstances of the scenario shows that the doctor is negligent, and now the doctor uh, and then the elements of res ipsa must be brought. Okay, so uh, this Shalini mentioned this case, the doctor of res ipsa cannot apply and cannot apply if the requirements are there. Okay, so that also uh, I think uh, I got no time to develop one by one, and the last uh, element will be causation. Okay, and causation is uh, the, this causal link, okay? The last element is most difficult element actually uh, to, to, to show the breach and the damage. Sometimes it's very clear cut, sometimes it's not very clear cut, okay? But then, uh, and and the more the difficulty of causation is because of the existence of uh, the part for test, which we still apply in Asia. And we have two types of causation, causation in fact and causation in law. Now causation in fact, Factual causation from the fact of the case, who is liable? Because sometimes there will be quite a number of events. For example, I claim that I have stomach ache, food poisoning, but I ate. I claim that it's the nasi ayam stall, but actually I ate from a few other stalls. We also provide uh, bad food. 
Yeah, so which stall actually caused me food poisoning? So we got to determine that. Causation in law is, I claim that I suffered 30 days in hospital, other people three days. So, you know, is that uh, the remoteness of damage? How much you found the defendant? How much he is liable? There should be a cut-off point. There could be intervening act. Uh, then we got to look at the eggshell skull rule and all that. Okay. So causation, in fact, as I said, but for tests, very rigid. Okay. If you ask, you say the food poisoning would not have occurred but for the nasi ayam stall. The answer must be yes. If you say, eh, not sure lah. It could be me mama lah. It could be laksa kedah lah. Uh, then, not liable. All not liable. Uh, caught against Kirby. If the damage would have happened just the same, fault or no fault, then that particular fault, that particular breach of duty is not the cause of the damage. Uh, so that's why, but for tests, uh, a lot of people can fail. But of course, we have uh, uh, a few other things that material contributed to the damage test and all that other thought. Uh. Okay, but then let us look at the case, Aziza Abdul Manan, uh, where in this case, she came to the hospital uh, bleeding, okay, and they checked that she was uh, urine test pregnant, but uterus empty, okay. So that means uh, unknown location uh, where is uh, what her, her fetus, yeah. But then she was having atopic pregnancy. Uh, but then uh, they were uh, conservative treatment uh, waited for it, for it to uh, what her bleeding to, to, to end. But then uh, she went, she discharged herself, came back, and then suddenly she already suffered all these complication, upper respiratory problem, and all that. And uh, they needed to do uh, operation to stop the bleeding. Okay, but then because of her problem of the, but then they need to that. All was explained to her, but she need to, of course, know that to stop the bleeding. Okay, so she agreed to it, but after that, she suffered all the consequences of this anesthetic complication. Okay, so there was an issue about the causal link. Yeah, because the doctor, uh, the claim was failure to, to manage the ectopic pregnancy, but then she suffered, she died, not because of the the ectopic pregnancy, but because of the anesthetic complication. Okay, so the, the issue of causal link, but the court held that uh, because they did not manage her ectopic pregnancy properly, that's why she suffered from consequences of loss of chance. Okay, so uh, that, uh, and therefore because of that, uh, because of that, uh, the court held that it was negligence by omission and the uh, causation effect was satisfied. Okay, and the case of Lu Choige, where the plaintiff went for cosmetic uh, operation, after that got swelling, went after that went to see many other doctors, but then it was discovered at the end there was a causal link because uh, that she got all this uh, infection from the uh, defendant's clinic uh, due to the lack of sterility okay in the premise so uh, quite straightforward okay and all these case failure to employ mad robot position causing the infant's injury they discovered there was a causal connection there and in the case of other godafur failure to prove the causal link between the victim because the victim suffered from uh subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage and there was actually no prospect of saving her okay uh 100 mortality so even though whatever they did, she will still die. Okay, so again, you know that, but for death, if you would have died anyway, the answer is, even though there's breach, not liable. Okay, last one, causation in law, uh, Mac, uh, Mac Roberts, uh, ni, apa? Uh, Mac Robert, pula dah, dah masuk Mac Robert. Okay, so the wagon law, foreseeable consequence test. Okay, you once you found the defendant, the defendant will be liable for all that can be foreseeable, the kind of damage must be foreseeable, but neither the manner nor extent need to be foreseeable. Okay, issues in causation in law, I don't want to elaborate so much. Okay, uh, that, that is uh, not, I mean, here and there a bit in our development of Malaysia, but this is quite settled. So this uh, wagon mount uh, says that you will be liable for all the injuries that are foreseeable, but the extent need not be foreseeable. What do you mean? If any injury befall a person, you got to take the victim as you find him. You cannot say that the victim is too weak. Eggshell lah. Kita, kita uh, pukul macam ni aja dah pecah. Okay? Uh, eggshell. So you got to accept. So if your victim, food poisoning, 30 days, you got to accept your victim as you find him. We got to watch out for intervening act. Uh, intervening of nature, not so much in medical negligence. Intervening of plenty because sometimes 
after the incident, the plaintiff need to to be uh, to 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 have further treatment, and then the plaintiff go and do something unreasonable, go and dance lah, apalah, and cause more harm to himself. So the original defender will not be liable, or intervening at third party, some other third party gave him the wrong drug, you know, apa, cause more harm to him. So the original defender will not be liable. So that is the remoteness of damage, the limit of the limitations which the defendant should pay. Okay. Now I just want to go on. Uh, uh, let me. I think I will take questions after this. Uh, I want to go on with uh, this. I just put it here because this is another federal court, the development assessment of damages, the federal court on the future damages. Yeah, future damages. But I'm not into it. But then uh, Inas Fakia. Okay, on future damages. So the courts, uh, the the rule is that uh, you must look be look at cogent evidence. So I just put this here. This is not the development of uh, federal court. Okay, I want to concentrate a bit here. Okay, so bear with me because this is uh, the on the issue of vicarious liability. Now, after the defendant is already found to be uh, liable, okay. Now under thought. The objective of law of thoughts, uh, where negligence is, uh, you know, a, a very big chunk of it. Okay, that uh, once you find the defendant, so the defender will be liable and need to pay compensation, monetary compensation damages. Okay, uh, so if you sue only the doctor, how much the doctor can pay? Yeah, like for example, if the plane crash, you need to sue the pilot with the. Air Asia, uh, with, with the uh, Air Asia uh, example, because why Air Asia is a big organization can pay million and Air Asia can allocate the loss, loss distribution mechanism can increase the price of product and services and still everyone can fly so can increase and you know so you know but now no, no one can fly yet but later can fly so vicarious liability and non delegable duty is uh, vicarious liability particularly is a mechanism. To achieve the main objective of tort law, okay, to provide compensation, and we know that vicarious liability under tort law, you need to find people who can pay and join together, okay, and be, and and employer is because we want to search for potential defendant because at the end we want to find who can pay, who can pay this amount of compensation. We say all these million million, okay, who can pay? Search for the potential defendant, and. Employers are always the potential defendant, healthcare providers, be it the private uh, government or whoever. Of course, we are looking at organizations. They can always pay. Okay. So, and they must be responsible for the employee because if they take the benefit of the employee, they must take the burden as well. Okay. So, the doctrine of vicarious liability imposes liability on employers. For the acts committed by the employees who are acting in the course of employment, provided that they are employees. Okay? Because why this is a common law principle, okay, from this respondent superior, the responsibility of superior for the act of the subordinate, middle turn against fowler, the act of the servant is the act of the master, and acquiesce against scam for all civil purposes, the act of the sheriff's belief is the act of the sheriff. Okay? And the principle of vicarious liability rests on the fundamental premise that employer is based is best yeah to make sure that they manage the risk of the business enterprise okay so they must make sure that employee uh you know they they train like, the employee to be good employees and to take care of safety of others and all that okay but the for the working of the employee, of course, employer liable only for employees, so they must be employee. Employee must have committed the tort because for the tort law, lah, not commit other branches of law. And then the employee have acted in the course of employment. Why? Because employee has bigger deeper pocket and he must take the benefit, take the burden as well. Employer must encourage accident prevention and the employer can distribute the loss. Okay? But the problem here is that Sometimes the thin dividing line, the demarcation between employer and independent contractor, because vicarious liability only works when you are employed under contract of service, not contract for services, independent contractor. So that has been the position. And the court has employed various tests, control tests, business tests, integration tests, and all these uh, multifactorial tests. And all these tests is still uh, okay, uh, in place. 
Okay, and uh, this has been quite uh, common in many cases now, where like in the case of Tan Eng Siu, the court look at, uh, particularly in private hospitals, uh, they want to look whether the doctor is independent contractor or part, and then they look at uh, whether he has clients on his own, he pay percentage of the doctor charges to fly uh, to hospital, and he takes the, the money. So all this nitty gritty are being looked at to determine whether the hospital wants to be liable. And in this, uh, whether this GP clinic, okay, uh, who took in a locum, yeah, this look like the patients pay direct payment to the clinic and not to the locum. The locum was paid hundred did not have any share. So the locum was considered to be employee and not independent contractor. And, you know, all this, you know, they apply the multiple test because to determine the aspect between employee and independent contractor because the hospital will not be liable if it is independent contractor. So, you know, a very taxing uh, task for the uh, court to look at, you know, to, to, to determine whether you are employee because now with modern modern economic condition, the control test is no longer enough. So we got to look at this multifactorial test. Okay. And then also look at he was whether he was independent contractor, not salary employee. And then the patient specifically chose the doctor. That also played a part. Now the case federal court, Dr. Court, okay, also look at Dr. Court was not directed the hospital to conduct the patient. Okay. And he was and he advised and arranged his own private clinic. Specific operation uh, was not undertaken on behalf of the hospital, but attributed to the doctor Cox, recognizably independent business. The diagnosis of the plaintiff's condition, the advice to undergo the operation, referral to the plaintiff was done in Dr. Cox's clinic, and Dr. Cox charges consultative operation to his patient. Okay, uh, to, to his patient. Okay. So many factors the court looked at, it's not exhaustive, but one thing the court looked at to determine between employee and independent contractor because Peter will only be liable for employee. Look at an uh, employment agreement, control and power employer has over employee, method of salary, prerogative of the uh, patient. We can see this. Okay. Okay. So, vicarious liability, the rule is employer not liable for the act of the independent contractor, contract force of this, only liable for employee, provided that you are the employee, all these tests to be used. However, the court in Dr. Court has mentioned that there are situations where even if the person delegate to a reputable contractor, to an independent contractor, sometimes the responsibility still lies with the hospital. Okay, you can delegate, you can say that the, all, all the people that work with you are independent contractor, but still you are going to be liable if non-delegable duty of care exists. Okay, so what is non-delegable duty of care? Non-delegable duty refers to the inability of the defendant to delegate liability. They can de delegate the task, but not the liability. And the, this uh, duty comes again, common law, Delton against Angus, a person causing something to be done, the doing of which cast him a duty, cannot escape from the responsibility attaching of him of seeing the duty performed by delegating it to a contractor. And uh, heels against Percival, the duty which the law casts on the defendant, but the defendant still remains the subject of that duty and liable for the consequences if it is not fulfilled, even though delegated to a third party. And the effect of imposing non deliberability is the person who owes a non deliberability cannot acquit himself by exercising reasonable care in entrusting the work to a reputable contractor, but must actually assure that it is done and done carefully. And Lord Denning in Cassidy mentioned that where, whether where a person himself is under a duty, he cannot get rid of his responsibility by delegating it to someone, be it a contract of service or contract for service. If you have a responsibility and will share against asset authority, okay, uh, a health authority which so conduct itself, it fails to, to provide doctor with sufficient skill experience and offer, you know, offer treatment, you'll be directly liable for to the patient in negligence. And Chai Beng Hock, Mr. Justice Abdul Rahman Sabri, a, a Sabah Medical Center has a duty to ensure that all doctors' practices are employed to they have the necessary skill and competency. It is no defense for the Sabah Medical Center to say that they are not responsible just because they are considered to be independent contractors. Okay. And Dr. Kok 
basically put this to rest and mentioned that non-delegable duty is applicable in Malaysia. Therefore, owners and managers of health institutions, providers of healthcare services will have a direct duty in law to ensure safety of the patient. They cannot claim that those who are there are independent contractors because the owners and managers of healthcare services, they have a duty to ensure that services are provided in a safe and effective manner. So non-delegable duty of care now is applicable in Malaysia according to Woodlands. Now, what, what does it mean uh, applicable in Woodlands? We look at lot assumption in Woodlands. Okay, the first is where the defendant engaged a contractor to perform an inherently hazardous task. Now, Woodlands is about this, uh, they employ independent contractor uh, swimming, uh, for uh, to uh, swimming teacher for the uh, students at the school. Okay, so one uh, student was injured during the swimming session. So, uh, but then because the the swimming instructor was considered to be independent contractor, so whether or not the school authority was still to be uh, or do not want to be liable. Okay, so but then the, uh, first we look at where, whether the circumstances where non delegable duty exists or not. The first is whether the, the, the uh, defendant engaged a contractor to perform an inherent hazardous extra hazardous activity and swimming was not part of it. But what kind of activity? An activity that is considered to be very dangerous a lot in the construction or whatever. Yeah, uh, there are cases of uh, Bernie uh, in Australia. Australia has developed a lot of this. Uh, you can read a lot of these kind of issues. Okay, and then uh, number two, this category. Uh, this category a lot of fit in. There is an antecedent relationship between the defendant and the claimant. Yeah, the kind of relationship uh, that has developed that you know you are supposed to take care of that person. Okay, and then therefore, even though you ask another person to do it, you will still be responsible. Okay, and you have a positive duty to protect that class of person. You have a duty as a school authority to protect school children. Okay, so anything that befall, you cannot say that you delegate. Okay, to the to another person, you need to be responsible. And the duty is personal to the if, if the duty if the duty is personal to the defendant, even though you de delegate, the duty still remain with the employer. Okay, uh, so this is the development. We are still to see all this development put in the proper framework because this has been just developed uh, in 2018. But we want to see more and more to explain what lot, lot assumption means. Uh, it's not it's not easy. I must say that now the labor duty, uh, Kepala juga baca, and Professor Genville Williams also mentioned that even in the UK, it has not been developed in a very much coherent way. Okay, so but we have applied this lah. Okay, so private hospitals particularly, they cannot claim that they have de delegated their duty, their responsibility to uh, independent uh, to independent contractors, the doctors, are independent contractors. The they will still be liable and if if it falls under the purview of non-delegable duty of care. So private hospitals particularly will still be liable for doctors uh, practicing in their hospitals. So my conclusion is healthcare providers need to ensure so far as practicable the way it conducts its operation does not put anyone members at risk of their health safety. Healthcare providers should allow their staff to treat patients and that uh, to, should not allow their staff to be patient and not don't want to accept responsibility for any wrongdoing. Employer has to provide safe system of work for the employees, and the employer should remain at all time responsible. And such duties cannot be delegated even to a reputable contractor. Thank you very much. Okay, that is uh, my uh, uh, lecture on the development of law, medical legal law in Malaysia. And I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, at the moment uh, now. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Putri Nemi, uh, for that very enlightening um, talk. Uh, there's quite a bit of development with law on medical negligence in Malaysia. Uh, because we're a little bit short of time, we've only got another 10 more minutes uh, before the talk ends. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to read through all through the questions, so we will limit it to uh, the first two questions uh, in the chat box. So this is a question from uh, Dr. Hafiza. Um, hi, Professor. I may, if I may clarify, the introduction of the Montgomery test 
in my opinion, did not bring much revolutionary changes in the outcome of the judgment, as many courts still choose to apply Rogers. Uh, she refers to the decision of Hamid Sultan in Ahmad Zubay Zahid and Dr. Dr. Zainal Abidin Abdul Hamid. It's important to appreciate that the Malaysian court's decision not to incorporate the broad test propounded in Montgomery's case or the patient's autonomy concept. Montgomery case opens the door to uh, robust pleadings as well as harsh cross-examination tactics which will lengthen the trial process as can be garnered in the instance case. Can I have your opinion uh, on this? Well, my opinion on this in the case of Zul Hasmina, uh, the, the federal court mentioned about Rogers against Whitaker, uh, the application of Rogers against Whitaker. Uh, yeah, I mean, at that time, 2017, it did not uh, uh, what elaborate. Yeah, uh, I mean, when, when it put its ratio, it mentioned about Rogers against Whitaker. So the, it, took, it took yeah the reasonable prudent patient that has developed in Rogers against Whitaker, rather than uh, looking into uh, the elaboration in Montgomery, okay. So we, you, for the for the standard of care for duty to warn, yeah, the federal court concentrated on the elaboration of the reasonable prudent patient test in Rogers against Whitaker. There may be some slight differences in the development uh, in the gist of uh, the development in Rogers and Montgomery in that kind of, you mentioned about this court. But I just want to uh, say that the federal court in Zul Hasmina look into and mention clearly about Rogers against Whitaker, the adoption of a reasonable prudent patient test in Rogers against Whitaker. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Putrinemi. Uh, so one last, uh, I think we still have a little bit more time, actually another 10 more minutes. So I think we can extend it to another Never mind, questions. never mind, another 10 minute extend also can. Ask us for the uh, to answer the question. Um, so this is a question from Ling Li. Spousal consent is unclear in women's reproduction. Example like contraceptive hysterectomy. How do we address this? There is no specific law for spousal consent. Okay. Yes. Yes. Very good. This question. Now, uh, spousal consent has uh, uh, is now very clear for hysterectomy uh, because hysterectomy affect the uh, the reproductive right of not just uh, affect the reproductive right of the spouse. Okay, so the case of Gurmit Kaur, okay, the case of Gurmit Kaur against Tung Shing Hospital, okay, has mentioned that spousal consent is necessary and in a way mandatory. Okay, uh, where the decision affect the reproductive right of the other spouse. So if you want to do hysterectomy, you know that. The husband will know that he cannot have any more child with the wife. So that is his reproductive right. So you need to inform him. So Gurmit Kaur has been very clear on this. Okay. The other thing is that, come the case of Abdul Razak Zezaman. I, I, Abdul Razak against Raja Badru Zezaman. Okay. And um, now that case a bit controversial because uh, it mentioned that the risk uh, the risk of uh, doing the uh, what the risk of aspiration uh, when you don't empty the stomach content and doing the rouse tube, uh, uh, putting in the rouse tube and all that, okay, uh, and uh, was not informed okay, to the uh, to the husband. Now I I told you the cardinal principle: adopt or sound mind makes their own decision. That's the cardinal principle in medical law. Okay, so why Abdul Razak becomes a bit controversial because why should you inform the husband? She is an, considered to be an adult assignment and makes her own decision. But the court uh, says that spousal consent was necessary when this particular patient is dependent on another to make decisions for her. Okay, so when spousal consent is necessary, when another person is, uh, uh, you know, when for the particular person, another person is very instrumental to make decision for that particular person. So, you know, it's very dependent. Okay. So, uh, so this is a bit, you know, uh, we can say that uh, what it causes a lot of 
again uh, uh, controversy for for that kind of violating this. You know, if you are adult summer, you make all the all decision. But if we look at the autonomy of the person, and if the person feels that I want my husband to make decision for me, so that is uh, it's my autonomy. Okay, that I, I want my uh, husband to because I think my husband makes very good decision from when I married him. Everything he decide my own. So there could be that kind of uh, circumstances, yeah, uh, surrounding that kind of relationship. Uh, okay, but but again, as I said, Abdul Raza and there's no appeal. I am just checking. There's no appeal, but that decision in Abdul Raza. But if I got Abdul Raza. Uh, uh, what uh, spousal consent is necessary when the other person is dependent on the other to make decisions for that person. Of course, the medical fraternity don't like this. Uh, also, another controversy because they said, how can uh, kita nak check ya? Siapa yang dependent, siapa yang tak dependent, pening kepala lah juga kan? Uh, so, you know, if you look at, but that, 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 that is in the case. That is in the case. Okay? Uh, whether the case is uh, Wrong. We need uh, another. Of course, we need a court of appeal, or maybe high court can distinguish. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prof. Um, so the next question is from uh, Dr. Liana. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, pertaining to mental capacity and legal competence, are doctors privileged to decide in clinical settings or such decisions in jurisdictions of the court? Uh, especially in situations where patients may be alert and claiming to understand things, however, may have underlying conditions such as low sugar level, low oxygen level that could impair their thinking process, whether it would be violating autonomy and how would the court address this? Now, uh, we have under Section 77, uh, 5 of the Mental Health Act 2010, okay, which says that uh, I mean, I mean, but because of course, when you look uh, that because when we look at that uh, that 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 act, we think that is only for mental health patient. But I think everybody, uh, in a way, we can say sometimes things happen that we can have some, uh, you know, uh, you know, when we are so uh, overwhelmed by pain and all that, and sometimes it can affect our mental uh, health. But then, but then, okay, let us look at section 77 sub 5. It says, uh, you need to get consent from the patient. Okay, such, uh, uh, section 77, you need to get consent from the patient himself for any surgery and all that. Okay, and if the patient cannot, uh, uh, the, uh, so, sorry, yeah, section 77, uh, you, can, you must get uh, consent from the patient if the patient is capable. If the patient is capable, okay. Now, section seventy-seven sub five. What do you mean by capable? Okay, capable. If the patient is able to understand the risk, benefit, and blah blah blah, I cannot uh, memorize uh, that section seventy-seven. Okay, uh, okay, but uh, here, okay. But then he mentioned about what is capable. Now, if not capable, okay, if not capable, then after that uh, is the guardian. Guardian, and then after that, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, if the the person not there, second one is the, uh, the 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 third one is the psychiatrist. Okay, two two uh, psychiatrists. So it mentioned that we have to check whether you are capable. Okay, if you are not capable, assessment is by the psychiatrist. I mean, I know that uh, provisions are very ideal and sometimes it's very difficult to put it in the practical way. But that is how I can mention about the law. Okay, uh, it's there. Um, so we have one last question. Uh, I know we do have a number of uh, questions, but we will limit it to this last question before we end today's talk. Uh, this is from Dr. Jagdev. Hi, Professor. We can see in hospitals, patients who, admin, who are admitted for treatment in a hospital for non-COVID diseases end up getting COVID due to contact by patients who are in the same cubicle. Can uh, the hospital be liable, uh, failure of the hospital or doctors to ensure the safety against COVID while admitted? 
Okay, now uh, with regards to the pandemic scenario, it's a, a bit uh, different. We got to look at the limitation. We have the limitation of resources and all uh, what, all those things that are pertinent uh, during the pandemic. Okay, and sometimes uh, if we, uh, for example, uh, we you know that there are uh, cases in the UK. Okay, that that came up about this. You know. Uh, issues of distributive justice, okay, who gets what, who gets first, and all that. Those are things that can come into play, okay, when we have a pandemic scenario, okay. So if what we do is following the SOPs in the during the pandemic, so it's very important all these SOPs during the pandemic, yeah, so that uh, it is put in place that uh, you know during this pandemic this can be done, that can be done, and uh, and all these issues of who gets first, who gets what, and all that can, uh, I mean, it, 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 it can be allowed. And as long as uh, this kind of practice is not in itself negligent. So it's, uh, common practice is always accepted in law as the practice to be adhered to, okay, as long as that practice is not uh, negligent. Okay, So, uh, so we have to look at the scenario of the uh, uh, during the pandemic, and if that uh, during the pandemic, this is what that has to be done because of the limitation of resources and all that. So that is uh, well and good. Yeah, there will not be any uh, breach of duty taking into account what resources that are available and all that. Thank you, Prof. Um, so I will pass on the mic to uh, Patrice Sophia to close on today's talk. Thank you, Prof. All right, thank you so much, Marie, as well as Susanna for moderating the session. And thank you so much to Prof uh, for okay. your time, despite, despite okay. your very super busy schedule. I know how many times I've been inviting you. Uh, and I'm really grateful for your time and sharing your insight. I never expect the slides to be as much as what you have uh, projected. So I really hope that you also have enjoyed sharing your research as well as development to our students. Uh, so to all the participants, I would just like to encourage everyone uh, to get a copy of uh, Prof book, which has been published uh, this year. Uh, it, it contains all the information which uh, Prof has already mentioned just now. And lastly, to commemorate this session, I would like to invite all participants to switch on their cameras so we can take a group picture with our guest speaker today. Okay, thank you so much everyone for being so sporting to take a picture. Just let me see if everyone is in. Fantastic. All right, so on the count to three, uh, we'll take a two a snapshot. So if everyone can look at your camera lens and give your best smile. One, two, smile. And another one. One, two, smile. Okay, that's all for today's webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for your yeah. time. And I hope Thank to you. see all of you guys again. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for attending the lecture. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you, Prof.